Uh, welcome to all of these distinguished colleagues who are much smarter than me, and I now feel like this has to be much better than I thought it was going to be uh, for me to be able to claim to teach them something. Uh, this is an experiment in which you're all unwilling participants. Um, we had, uh, so I'm a researcher in the RAD lab, which is just down the hall here. We care about data center scale internet systems and the various issues of software programming and systems that go along with that. Um, and we have found over the last year or so that Ruby on Rails, this great new programming environment, has gotten a fair amount of traction um, in our lab as well as in the community. We talked at the most recent uh, retreat that we did with our uh, industry people. Uh, by the way, welcome, Rad Lab sponsors and affiliates, your tax dollars at work here. Um, we uh, did a little presentation on an undergrad course that we had done last semester, uh, introducing some undergrads at Berkeley to Ruby on Rails, why we think it's going to be a useful programming environment for the Rad Lab generally, and it was so well received that uh, we were actually asked to put something like this together. So we will do our best over the course of the next six hours or so to uh, tell you about what we've been doing with Ruby on Rails, give you enough of an intellectual overview of it that you can participate intelligently in discussions about it, um, and hopefully convey something that we feel, which is that uh, Ruby on Rails really has changed the way that we think about programming and specifically about web applications programming. So um, I'm Armando. Some of you already know me. Uh, Will Sobel is over in the corner here. He's a professional Rails developer who is also uh, uh, has a part-time appointment in the Rad Lab, so he's going to be doing about half of the material today. Um, in terms of logistics, uh, today you will uh, hopefully learn the basics of Ruby on Rails. That's kind of the first three hours with breaks in between. Then you'll eat. Then you'll learn more Ruby on Rails. And while you eat, we'll fix up the second half of the slides. Um, optionally, if you look at the course homepage, there was a link in the email that we sent out. There are one-click installers there to get a Rails environment running on pretty much every popular platform. So if you want to, uh, to take the time to do that, I know some people here have probably already done this. Uh, by the way, show of hands, who has mucked around with Ruby on Rails, even if it's just kind of downloading a tutorial, yada, yada? So, wow, OK, a lot of people, good. Um, so that means that a lot of this first section will go fast. Um, and for those of you who uh, stick around afterward, yes? Uh, Airbears requires a login per person, as far as I remember. And if you find, um, are, Mike, could you help? So sometime between now and the first break, uh, Mike Howard, one of our Rad Lab sysadmins, will uh, get n passwords established on Airbears so that you can check your email during all of the other sections. Um, so those of you who can stick around for a little bit after the official class is over, uh, we're trying to get a discussion going about other things that are going on at UC related to Ruby on Rails and how it might present some pedagogical opportunities. Um, in particular, we're going to be doing the undergrad course again starting in just a couple of weeks. And we have some ideas about tying it to other courses, including our database course and uh, the uh, scheme course, the structure and interpretation of computer programs. So any administrative stuff before we blaze on? Good. Um, so hopefully, we'll be able to get you to understand something about Ruby on Rails, see it in action, uh, understand why it's good or bad versus other frameworks you might choose, uh, discuss intelligently with your colleagues when they talk about it, and let you know where to go if you want to learn more. In other words, knowing what you don't know. Um, there's a lot of things where I'm going to have to do a very quick review of a topic in order to provide a small amount of, of scaffolding intellectually. So I will not, you know, as much as I would love to discuss set theory and predicate logic and how it relates to relational databases, I won't do that. I'll just say, this is a table and this is what select does. And if you, you know, if you're already familiar with that, great. Um, we can't be all things to all people. I know some people here probably have not done any Rails programming. A few people have done, uh, it sounds like, the tutorials online, uh, probably a, a few levels in between. So uh, please forgive me if some of it is review, and please forgive me if some of it goes a little bit fast. We had thought about trying to do some kind of interactive finger exercises like lab work, but we decided in a one-day course there's just not enough time. So if we do a two-day version of this, uh, that might be something that we'll try to do. We will assume that you're familiar with language features like object orientation and inheritance, at least at the level of, say, Java. Uh, I know at Berkeley we teach a lot of courses in Java, so that seemed like a reasonable assumption. Uh, hopefully you are basically familiar with HTTP, HTML, and Relational Databases 101. I will do sort of one slide on each of those things for the benefit of those who uh, wouldn't mind a little bit of a refresher. Um, here's our end user license agreement. You may not realize it, but by sitting here, you have already agreed to our license agreement. So I'm going to, as a courtesy, remind you of what it is that you have legally agreed to. Uh, if you benchmark this against the other courses, you can, oh, no, wait, sorry. That's the DeWitt clause. That's not our, uh, our, our UA. Um, you acknowledge that we can automatically check what OS and programs you're using and install the ones we, oh, wait, that's, sorry, that's Windows Vista. This is the real EULA. 
Uh, by staying here, you agree that you're willing to fill out a one-minute survey, which we'll do electronically uh, probably tomorrow, and that you'll actually give us feedback so that if we do this again, it will be better. Uh, and in fact, I would like you during the day to kind of think about the meta survey, which is what do you think we should ask on the survey so that you can give us good feedback. <laughs> OK. Um, so I, I don't know that uh, this is really necessary. I may already be preaching to the choir, or at least to the, those who have drunk the Kool-Aid. Uh, but just in case I'm not, um, if you're a developer, uh, you're, uh, my, my understanding from Will, who spends a lot of his time on this, is that there are no unemployed Ruby on Rails developers now, and that there's positions available pretty much all the time for them. Um, we actually think that this is not a fad, that Ruby on Rails is going to stick around. So if you're a developer or a practitioner, it behooves you, I think, to be familiar with it. Uh, if you're a faculty member, it pays you to know what your students are working on. I was actually dragged into the Rails world about a year or so ago by one of the grad students in the Rad Lab. And my reaction was, oh yeah, PHP, Perl, Python, now this. I'll get right on it. Um, and since then, I actually have immersed myself in it somewhat. And I, I have come over to the other side. I really think that there is, there is a there there. And uh, as Dave Patterson likes to say, there's probably a pony in there somewhere. Um, and if you're a student, well, if you're a student, you're probably not here. You're already writing Rails applications and selling them to startups, so you don't need convincing. So here we go. Uh, the outline for the whole day, each of those numbered chunks is approximately an hour, although I'm sure we're going to run over. Uh, this first chunk, we're going to do a quick review of web applications and what they are. Model View Controller, which is a, a long-standing concept from the uh, UI community. Uh, SQL 101, and we'll put that all together into a very simple Hello World application in Rails. Uh, after that, Will will talk for an hour about the Ruby language. I'm actually not going to talk about the Ruby language at all, because it's generally easy enough to read that if you programmed in pretty much any other modern high-level language, you can read Ruby code and to a first order know what it's doing. Uh, but Will will talk about some of the actual language features. And then when we come back and inspect uh, Rails in a little bit more depth, you'll see how the language features enable the framework features. Um, then you'll eat lunch while Will and I fix up our slides for Act 2. Uh, and then we'll talk about some of the really cool stuff, uh, advanced model relations. In other words, how you can uh, build applications that manipulate <coughs> uh, essentially object graphs without ever doing a, a word of SQL and having all the ugly stuff done for you. Uh, a lot of the real power of Rails actually comes from that. So that's going to be kind of the linchpin. Um, we'll talk about Ajax, uh, not the cleaning product, but the new technology that enables these great Web 2.0 sites where interactions don't require a full page reload. I'm sure you've all used them. Uh, we'll also talk about testing, something you don't expect to hear about in a one-day workshop. But testing is actually sufficiently non-painful uh, that when we did our undergraduate class last semester, most of the projects that were done by the end of the uh, semester, almost half of the lines of code written were test code. Um, and that wasn't even a requirement, by the way. It wasn't a checkoff feature. Uh, and then configuration and deployment and how Rails makes that easier as well. And as I said, for those of you who are willing to stick around afterward, uh, I would love to talk about Ruby on Rails and pedagogy. So. Uh, that's enough time for everybody to have gotten here who's going to be here. Any questions? Shall we blaze on? OK. Here we go. Uh, so in this first hour, uh, web applications, model view controller, deconstructing a really trivial Hello World application. And I will actually be running the application on my laptop if all goes well. We'll see. Uh, and kind of show you what's where in a Rails application and how Hello World uh, maps onto the model view controller view of the world. OK. For those of you who have been living in a cave, Oh, that's OK. Uh, just in case you haven't had to dig into how a web application works, basically web applications are RPC all over again. The difference is that now the protocol that carries the messages is HTTP. It's a very simple ASCII-based request reply protocol. It runs over TCP IP. Uh, the protocol, whoops, uh, ASCII headers in the protocol specify metadata about the request, like what kinds of data formats I would be prepared to accept in response to my request. Um, and as we'll see, almost every web framework has had to work around the fact that HTTP is stateless. So every HTTP transaction to a server is uh, completely separate from every other transaction. Um, despite the fact that when you navigate any non-trivial website, you have the illusion of a connected session. So we'll talk about how various frameworks, including Rails, give you that abstraction. Uh, how do you pass the arguments to RPC? Basically, a URL names the place where you're going to do the remote procedure call. Um, the arguments are passed either embedded in that same URL, and if you've ever, I was warned this would happen, uh, if you ever see a URL with a bunch of garbage tacked onto the end, those are usually parameters. If you submit an HTML form where you fill out a bunch of stuff on the screen, the contents of what you filled out are actually encoded, and that's sent as a set of parameters. Um, so you can embed those argument values either in the URL or they can be uploaded as part of the form submission. So this is my very simple Web Applications 101 diagram of how the web works. Any questions? Because that's all we're going to do on that. HTTP in one slide. How does it act? So what is the life cycle of a web request? 
Uh, your web browser will open a TCP connection, usually on port 80 to the destination server. Uh, it will send a request something like this, saying, I want to get a resource, as opposed to I am sending you data. And you know, if there's two ways to do something, PowerPoint will do it wrong. Uh, here's the resource I want to get. In this case, it's just the home page, index HTML, the version of the protocol that I'm using, which browser I am, and a, a bunch of other boring stuff we don't care about. Uh, a cookie, which is a, a handle, as we'll see, that actually ties all of your requests together from the server's point of view so that it can differentiate that you are a particular user doing a sequence of things. If all goes well, the server will reply, uh, I understand your protocol version. My response code is 200, which if you look it up in the spec means everything is all right. And I'm about to send you this many bytes worth of something encoded in text HTML, which is far and away the most common answer. And here we go. Here's the content. Um, the thing that gets sent back more often than not is HTML that bundles a bunch of other stuff inside of it. Uh, again, for those of you who have never actually had to look at HTML, which I understand is increasingly common, uh, it's basically a hierarchical collection of elements that make up a viewable page. Some of those elements are inline and are displayed immediately, like headings or tables. Some of them are embedded. So an image is an embedded element that actually requires a separate round trip to the server to fill in. Uh, the same is true for things like Java applets. Uh, or they could be forms, where you're actually asked for some input, you fill some stuff in, you click Submit, and then that stuff gets sent back up to the server. Um, of interest from our point of view, um, you know, if you're like me, you actually did some hand coding of HTML back in the bad old days, uh, and you probably didn't use element attributes. Um, the element attribute most people are familiar with, even of, of my generation and older, is when you have a hyperlink. There's an href attribute, which tells you what the target of the link is. Well, it turns out that other elements can have attributes too. And although uh, we didn't used to use them in the bad old days, um, the ID and class attributes are particularly important. Uh, ID basically lets you attach an arbitrary symbolic name to any element in the page. And class allows you to tag uh, any subset of elements in the page with a common name so that uh, you can then attach visual styles to those things. The reason this is important, damn it, uh, is that when, as you'll see when we get to Rails, the ability to pull out the visual information and then just conditionally tag elements turns out to be a really powerful way to get uh, different ways for the page to display without putting conditional logic into it. But we'll uh, leave that for later. Uh, who's familiar with CSS, cascading style sheets? Great. For the few of you who are not familiar with it, it's basically a really simple way to map visual appearance to things like IDs or class attribute tags that appear in your, uh, in your HTML document. Uh, the current incarnation of HTML is really XHTML. Pretty much, it's just a lot stricter about syntax, so it's easier to parse, and therefore, it's more device portable. But don't worry too much about that. As far as we're concerned, HTML is HTML. Dynamic content generation in one slide. Uh, most useful applications today really aren't serving you HTML pages at all. What they're serving you is dynamically generated content that happens to be wrapped up in HTML. Um, and the earliest attempt to get this to work was something called the Common Gateway Interface, hence CGI and CGI bin. Uh, basically, the web server at whatever site will be configured to map certain URLs not to actual static pages, but to a program that gets run. It's then that program's responsibility to generate output that can be handed back to the browser. Uh, typically, as I said, the, the parameters that the program is going to be passed and the function name, in other words, what code path to be taken in the program, would be either passed as part of the URL or maybe they were passed as part of a form submission. So for example, uh, I might be doing a search at foo.com and the search parameters that, I'm, uh, that I want to pass to the search engine are actually embedded right in the URL. Uh, the application is then supposed to either generate HTML content or maybe it has a bunch of HTML templates and it runs some code to inject the content into those templates. Um, and as we said, because HTTP is stateless, uh, typically on your first visit to the server, the server will hand you back a cookie, which is this usually opaque gibberish looking string that you're supposed to pass back to it on every subsequent request. Again, I'm oversimplifying in the interest of time, but your passing the cookie back uh, on each subsequent request is what allows the server to tie your request together as a session. Um, usually the cookie is, is used to index something on the server side, typically some big chunk of stuff in a database that is the moral equivalent of a continuation for your session, right? where you've been or where you are in a page flow, uh, things like whether you've logged in, uh, if you've established credentials. So the fact that pretty much that, you know, these two problems, how do you call a piece of code, figure out which function, what parameters to pass to it, how do you synthesize a session out of stateless requests, those problems are common to pretty much every dynamic content web application. So regardless of what programming language you're using to write the app, um, those problems have had to be solved. And that's really why frameworks evolve. They, they evolve to capture this very common structure. Make a request, figure out who it is, figure out what program to run, pass parameters, grab the output, and then do something useful with the output, passing it back through the web server. Um, the reason I use the term framework, by the way, uh, in my not so humble opinion, a framework is not just a bunch of libraries, it's also a locus of control. 
So the fact that it's a framework means you don't have to worry about who owns main. You essentially are writing handlers of various kinds, and your handlers will get invoked, pass some arguments, they'll generate some stuff, and then it's someone else's problem to figure out who that gets sent back to. And it's someone else's problem to demultiplex incoming stuff and make sure that the right handler gets called and so on. Um, so that, you know, that's kind of the dynamic content generation in terms of a framework. This is the pattern that's been followed for most of the common ones. You know, J2EE, Ruby on Rails now, um, PHP, and you know, the various others. <clears throat> OK, so let's wrap all that up and get on to actual Ruby on Rails. Uh, the life cycle of a dynamic content generation app is the browser will request something. Uh, using HTTP. The server will respond with a status code, ideally with some content if the status code indicated that things went well. HTML is usually the, the uh, it's most common content type. Other things tend to be wrapped up in it. And not surprisingly today, the vast majority of HTML is not written by humans anymore. It's templated and otherwise filled out uh, by these applications. Uh, we haven't talked about post, but roughly speaking, it's the second most common request. And it's what happens when you've been asked to fill out a bunch of stuff on a form. You click the Submit button. All that stuff gets marshaled and it gets sent back in a way that the server can unpack it using known techniques. Um, we also didn't talk about what other responses besides OK you might get. But one that is going to turn out to be important, uh, which is un misleadingly called found, uh, is actually what most of us think of as a redirect. It's when you go somewhere and, in fact, the reply says, actually, where you meant to go is this other place. Go there now. So that's actually two separate round trips from the web browser's point of view. Um, the reason that I call this out is because, as we'll see, this mechanism is leveraged to interesting effect in Rails to handle both exceptional conditions um, and cases where you want to uh, basically merge code paths back together. So the original semantics, for, by the way, was this, um, the thing that you're looking for still exists, but the URL has been changed. Uh, but we'll see that it's, it's actually being used for handling retry conditions, and that's, it's, that's the reason that I call it out now. OK, so you've installed Rails, or I don't know, maybe you've installed Rails. You want to get your first application going. Uh, we'll call it Hello World. I actually downloaded some screenshots via Google Images. So uh, our Hello World is actually a cookbook application. And perhaps morbidly, I'm going to use students as one of the models. So cookbook, students, you, know, you do the math. Um, but once you install Rails and you want to set up your application, here's what you do. You CD to some place that's your development directory. And you say Rails and an application name, uh, which basically runs a whole bunch of scripts to set up this structure that you see along the left-hand side. Um, the pieces that we're going to uh, spend the most time on is in the subdirectory where you created your app, you will see a sub-subdirectory called app. Guess what that stands for? Uh, inside of which are controllers, models, views, and helpers. Uh, don't worry too much about helpers, but controllers, models, and views are exactly the C, M, and V in, in well, the M, V, and C in the MVC model of the world, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Uh, there's a configuration directory, which we won't talk about too much. There's a library of useful scripts to help develop your application. And we're going to see one of those in action in just a little bit. And look, there's a subdirectory called test, optimistically assuming that you're going to actually write some tests. Uh, in fact, there's a lot of infrastructure that's built right in to help you do that. And we'll see that a little bit later in the day as well. Um, this presumes, by the way, that when it comes time to deploy your application, um, deploying is essentially going to mean copying all of this stuff over to your ISP and hoping that your ISP has configured things such that Apache understands uh, that certain URLs really are going to get mapped to the Rails application subdirectory. Um, virtually every major ISP has a way to do this now. So your mileage may vary. And when Will Sobel talks about deployment, um, he'll talk more about how to automate that process too. <clears throat> so let's look at a truly trivial, truly trivial hello world. And this is where we hope that things are actually working the way that, uh, that I believe they're going to work. Because I have, by the way, I use Emacs and you should too just to get that religion out of the way. <laughs> OK, here's a truly trivial uh, hello world. It's actually a three-part hello world, because uh, as we'll talk about in a moment, in the model view controller uh, schema of the world, uh, the controller is actually the thing that is going to be handed my request when I make it. In other words, that's where the, the dispatching and demultiplexing logic lives. Um, there's also going to be. Uh, here's a really simple view. All it does is print hello world. And we won't talk about a model for now. Uh, I have actually set up my application and I have a, uh, whoops, there. And sure enough, here's my app directory. As advertised, it has controllers, helpers, models, and views. Uh, I have put this controller and this view in their respective subdirectories. And now I'm going to fire up the application and cross my fingers. <clears throat> 
huh, well, nothing really happened here. Actually, all I did was hit the web server in a place where it says, I recognize that you're hitting me in a place where Rails applications live, but you haven't actually named an application. All right, well, you actually haven't named a controller method. Let's do that. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Whoops, that's not what I meant. Nope, oh, hold on, we can do this. There we go. I knew it would work. OK, so what happened here? Um, I happen to have my local web server set up so that incoming requests on port 3002 are going to get routed to the Rails dispatcher for this particular test app that we're starting out. Um, you'll notice that it's no coincidence that my URL has hello slash say, and that when I showed you these files, hello controller is the place where the say method lives, and say.rhtml is the place where hello world is printed out. So what's, let's see what's actually going on here. Uh, so I invoke my application uh, by going to the, you know, if, if I had deployed this on a real ISP, this local host part would be my ISP name slash whatever my ISP requires to get me to the Rails subdirectories. Um, let's make the app slightly less trivial. And here's the other place where I cross my fingers. I'm sure I'll get some helpful warning about viruses, even though I have a Mac. One point three gigahertz, and it takes that long to open a file. Yes. Blech. Okay. Um, I have a bunch of extra code snippets here, and I'm now going to put some of them into Hello Controller. In particular, let me grab this method, which we're going to call say2. Uh, I will save the file. By the way, notice that there's no compile part of this cycle. Now let's change say to say2. Huh. I said, hmm, what's going on there? Well, we also have. We can do this. I tried to figure out a good way to uh, automate this, but I really couldn't. Good. All right. So this is say2.rhtml. Uh, in other words, it's the view corresponding to my say2 method that I just uh, put in. And in this case, you can see that I'm actually doing an interpolation. As you will learn shortly, this means that what is an instance variable. You'll find out what it's an instance of what class pretty soon. And this bracket notation, the percent signs mean execute code, and the equal sign means, and also uh, interpolate their output from the code as what's going into the web page. So it seems that what's happening is that it's looking for an instance variable called what and wants to interpolate into this page. In fact, using the fact that, uh, whoops, well, you'd think that would have worked. All right, well, you're going to have to take my word for it. Um, <laughs> let me make sure that I have the, uh, did I put the controller method in there? Oh, I should be calling it message. That's part the, that's missing from the guided tour. So my initial hello world just called this empty function say. Uh, my new hello world, I'm going to invoke a URL that calls the function say2, and it's going to look for something in a, this array that seems to be called params. Uh, it's going to look for something whose key is message, and it's going to assign that to the instance variable. Um, what I said before is that you can embed parameters into a URL, and it's going to look for one called message. Whoops. How did I do that? There. Ta-da. Demos actually work. Amazing. So what's going on here? Yeah? Maybe you're about to say this, but what causes the dark dot .rhtml file to actually be included? I did not see any reference. To we'll, we'll get there. Just suspend disbelief for just a few more moments. We're, we're going to get there. Uh, so what happened in this case? Again, um, here's the actual URL that figures out which method is going to be called. Uh, here is a bunch of extra garbage. In fact, I could put other stuff here, and it still wouldn't matter. Um, what happens in the controller? Uh, as you will learn, uh, params is the automatically demarshaled arguments, whether they came from a form submission or a URL or wherever else. Uh, they have been conveniently converted into a hash table, also called an associative array or a content addressable array. The keys to the array are, uh, everybody familiar with Lisp scheme symbols? This is symbol notation. Uh, it's not really a string. It's just a thing whose value is itself. And the colon is what indicates that a symbol is coming. You'll learn more about that in the next hour. But basically, by the time we get to the controller, 
the Rails framework has already unmarshaled all of the arguments into this params array. I'm just dereferencing the array to find the one called message, assigning it to the instance variable. And in a moment, we'll get to John Osterhout's question of how does it know that that say2.rhtml is what's supposed to be rendered? So we'll get there in a minute. Um, so here's the deal. What, what actually happened from a, a slightly more structured perspective is that we just instantiated a really trivial version of model view controller. Uh, this is kind of a design pattern that's been around. It comes from the UI literature. It's been around for a long time. And it's a way of uh, enforcing a nice separation between a model of data, the way that the user is allowed to interact with that data, and the way that the results or, or some representation of the data is uh, displayed back to the user. So in the traditional model, there's, sorry, in the traditional design pattern, there's the model, which is the actual data that you're manipulating. There's a view, which is a way of presenting something about the model to the user. For example, an HTML page. There's a controller with which, with which the user interacts, typically via the view, say by doing UI actions like clicking on stuff. The controller typically has access to the model information and makes it available as necessary to the view in order to present it. So this, you know, if you've ever taken sort of you know, UI 101, you have seen this somewhere. In the Rails world, whoop, uh, so in the Rails world, the controller is a file containing Ruby code. The view is an RHTML template. As we'll see, there's also other kinds of templates, but this is the most common. We'll look at it first. <clears throat> and usually, the model is a bunch of stuff stored in a SQL database. It doesn't have to be. It actually turns out to work with non-relational databases as well by faking it, but we won't talk about that. So what happens in the controller? Uh, the controller, um, from the view, the user can interact by clicking on stuff, by uploading a file, whatever. Uh, the controller has access, as we'll see, to the information stored in the SQL database, so it can do both reads and updates. And it provides some of that data. Uh, usually in the form of a set of instance variables, to one or more RHTML templates that will then interpolate them with HTML and render the results. So getting back to John's question of how does it know that when I type the say2 URL, it uses the say2 RHTML file to render the result? Um, the answer is the first instance you're going to see of something called convention over configuration. This is basically the Rails framework's way of saying if you follow some simple common sense conventions about naming and syntax and a few other things, you save yourself having to do a lot of explicit configuration. So here's an example. I said we're going we're to do a data model called a student, which we'll define shortly so that we can cook them. Um, but given that we've chosen to name our data model student, and by the way, naming it with an cap initial capital letter is part of the convention, right? So don't ask why the convention is. Just accept for the moment that it is one. Your model name shall begin with a capital letter followed by lowercase letters. Um, if we do that, then we will be able to assume that there will be a models file called student.rb, which defines the methods that we operate uh, on that data. Uh, there will be a SQL table called students, which is the pluralization of student, notice. Uh, a table row will be an instance of a student object. And the columns of the student table will be the attributes of that object. Uh, there will be a controller that has methods that can update and read data from the student model and provide it to student views. That controller is going to be in the controller subdirectory, and it will be called student underscore controller dot rb. Not capital student, not student dash controller, but with an underscore all lowercase. Remember, it's a convention. Um, and there's going to be a bunch of views that present uh, different ways of rendering information about students. They're all going to be located in a subdirectory student under views, and they're going to have names of the form splat.rhtml, where the splats are going to map to controller methods. Let's see what this actually means uh, you know, in, in terms of our Hello World application. Um, you notice in our Hello World, we actually didn't manipulate models at all. There was no, no database was involved. It was just a controller and a view, um, which is ironic because, as you'll see, one of the major strengths of Ruby on Rails is what it lets you do with uh, an underlying relational database. So we did have one controller. And sure enough, it was called hellocontroller.rb. There it is. Um, in our case, we only defined two methods in the controller. Um, and roughly, again, this is part of the convention over configuration. The assumption is, unless you say otherwise, each controller method has a corresponding view. Right? So by default, when it falls off of the end of executing a controller method, unless you've said otherwise, the next thing to do is going to be to look in a directory corresponding to the model. Uh, in this case, we don't have a model. But when we do the student example, we will. Um, look in that subdirectory for a view whose name is foo.rhtml, where foo is whatever the controller method was named. Right? So when I called the say2 method, which I did by having say2 as part of my URL, the assumption is I fall off the end of the method call. In other words, I do a variable assignment. And the very next thing I do, since nothing else has been specified, is look for a view called say2.rhtml in the hello subdirectory of views. 
And indeed, if we look in the hello subdirectory of use, <clears throat> that's one of the ones that's there. Uh, let's do something even slightly less trivial. Question? Yes? If you are foolish or uh, antisocial enough to want to have uh, configuration different from the convention? You, everything can be overridden. Everything can be overridden. It's the, but in a moment, I'm going to demonstrate another feature that will realize just how foolish you would be if you were to do that. Uh, but yes, the, the, but the answer is always yes. That's why it's convention over configuration. You can always override it, and the ways of overriding it vary from trivially simple to a royal pain in the butt. Uh, OK, so let's make it even slightly less trivial. Uh, we're going to add two new methods and the corresponding views to go with them. Uh, one of the methods is going to allow us to fill in a form for Mad Libs. Does anybody remember Mad Libs? <sighs> Only people who make me feel old remember Mad Libs. Uh, but it's going to be quite trivial. Uh, and we're also, so we're going to add, we're actually going to need two forms. One of them is going to allow you to enter stuff to populate a Mad Lib. The other one is going to display a Mad Lib with your data interpolated into it. So that implies that we are going to have two controller methods as well. Right? One of them is going to be a controller method that does nothing except set you up to let you fill in that form. The other one is going to be the method that receives what you're submitting by that form and makes it available for display some other way. So since I have, um, let's find, no, that's not the one I wanted. Uh, which file did I put that in? Nope, hold on. This is the, uh, where I couldn't figure out how to do this in a nice macroized way. <sighs> okay, well, I know it's going to be here. Maybe I'll just do it by hand. Huh. All right, no problem. We'll do it by, ha by hand. So there's going to be our madlib input method. Uh, it's an empty method. It doesn't actually do anything. All it's going to do is set up to call this view. <sighs> OK, so here's my really simple view. Uh, in fact, we can look at it in the context of. <coughs> Okay, so again, the URL encodes the, uh, base, the class that we're operating on. We'll, we'll see when we start defining different models. This is essentially the, the name of a model. Uh, in this case, it's the, actually the name of the controller, hello controller. This is the method within the controller to call. Our method does nothing. All it does is fall through displaying this view. Um, now, before I hit this submit button, uh, let's look at a couple of things about how this is structured. Here is the file that actually displays what all you just saw. Uh, you notice that instead of having the traditional HTML form elements, I've got these things that appear to be macros. They're really not, but um, one of the nice things about the language is that it's hard to tell the difference between a macro and a language construct. So here's something that says, or appears to say, I'm going to start an HTML form. This says, when the form is submitted, this is what you're going to do. You're going to call the controller method called madlib. Again, by convention, it's assumed to be in the same controller that we just came from, but that can be overridden. Uh, now. You'll notice here's our, our subject field, and next to it there's a text input box. It, you can see that that was generated by text field tag. Um, the, uh, suffice it to say for now that the first argument to this is what the name of the field is going to be, right? And as if you're thinking, which you are because you've all had a lot of coffee like me, uh, that should tell you that when we go back into the controller, the params array is going to have a key called noun, or the symbol version of noun, and it's going to correspond to whatever I typed. And you'll see that that's indeed the case. The second value, should you provide a non-empty string, is a default value to fill in the field. And here's a bunch of other ar optional arguments that you could put in for how wide the field is and whether you're not allowed to type stuff and, and what on. So there's a whole bunch of these. Uh, you'll notice that for this very last one, uh, I actually included an empty string. That's why when we originally displayed the page, I had to fill in something for this field, the word student. Um, here's the submit tag. And again, obviously, the argument to this is the value. That's what's going to be displayed in the button. Uh, how does it know what the submit tag is supposed to do? Because when we had the start form tag up here, uh, I specified what the action was going to be. Right? So the submit tag is just going to uh, do that action, and then the form is ended. If you actually look at the HTML that was generated, you can see it corresponds pretty closely to my template. Um, here's what came out of that uh, start form tag. Uh, 
Here's an example of what came out of one of those text field tags. And if you go down here, uh, here's an example of what came out of the submit tag. Now, of course, if we submit it, we're going to have a problem because anybody? Bueller? Anybody? Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm saying that the start form tag should point at an action called madlib. But if we go back to the controller, there is no such action. In fact, we can verify. Whoops. <laughs> wow. Maybe it's using a different controller. That's. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, it's I have like three versions of the app running, uh, and it's the actions madlib, not madlib input. Yeah, which is why I I was hoping for an exception. No, it's going to hello madlib. Well, that's all right. Not to worry. Um, we'll define the action now. Uh, so, if I look at the oh, actually, I know I know what the answer is. Um, but I'm not going to explain it now. <laughs> uh, it's basically my failure to version my code correctly. Uh, so here is the proposed template for displaying the thing that you type in. Uh, and again, it's just a bunch of really simple HTML where I've interpolated these instance variables, noun, verb, edge, and direct object, uh, which means that I expect a controller method to grab, what did I say, noun, verb, adjective, and direct object. And what did I call these in my Madlib input template? I call them noun, verb. Ah, so I can actually get a little fancier. So I'm going to grab this one. But, and by the way, this is doing it the hard way. I'm, I'm, there's a short, if, I, if this is what I wanted to do, there's a much shorter way of doing it. Uh, actually, this is, let's get fancy. Uh, you'll notice that I have this checkbox for whether I want to use an adjective or not. So let's use that. Uh, and again, yes, there is shorthand for doing all of this, but I'm, I'm favoring simplicity here. Uh, and for cleanliness. Thank you. Uh, and what did I call the direct object? Anybody remember? Direct object, good. Good. Uh, and again, if I fall off the end of the method, the assumption is that I'm going to look for uh, a view whose name matches the name of the method. In this case, the name of the method is madlib. So it's going to look for a view called madlib.rhtml. And if the gods of demo are smiling, we should actually be able to do this. How about that? Good. That seemed to work. Uh, and in fact, if I remove the optional adjective, Good. That does what you expect, right? So there's no rocket science here, but you kind of see what the flow of uh, the if, trying to get used to the flow of demultiplex the URL, unpack the parameters, look for the right controller method, fall off the end of the method, and by default, try to render a template that matches the method name, right? Now, when we do uh, some better examples, when we go into Rails in depth, there's a whole lot of things you can do if you fall off the end of the method. In particular, you want to be able to do things if something goes wrong in the method. For example, I submit a form and something about my submission doesn't work. Um, I need multiple different code paths to recover from that. Um, and we'll show various different ways of doing that. But this is, you know, start getting this ingrained as the way to think about the world. Um, it seems a little bit unwieldy when you first look at it that in order to do a one line hello world, you actually need to touch three different files. Uh, but you'll get over that. So, okay, back to. So, given this amount of background, what is Ruby on Rails in simple terms? Ruby is a language which you're going to meet in some depth in the next hour, which is dynamically typed. It's interpreted, at least for the time being. Uh, it is pure object oriented, so everything is an object. Even like nil is an object, three is an object. Uh, and it's functionally inspired. So it's not a pure functional language, but you'll see that <clears throat> enough of how it works allows you to use the same kind of you know, postfix notation, like chaining list operators and stuff that you would do in a purely functional language. Rails is an application framework for writing web applications that embodies the model view controller design pattern. Um, it emphasizes convention over configuration. You've just seen one or two examples, but we're going to see examples of that over and over again. Um, and it leverages the language features of Ruby in very interesting ways. Uh, in particular, it leverages the dynamic typing. It leverages metaprogramming. So Ruby is a language that gives you first class functions. And there's a lot of neat things that Rails uses that for uh, to provide elegant support for both of those goals, for supporting a good MVC separation and for making convention over configuration the preferred way to do stuff.
Um, and just a reminder, I call it a framework because unlike just a set of libraries, it also handles a lot of the dispatching for you. And in fact, even in our simple example, you saw that, right? I just provided some controller methods and some corresponding views, and all of the glue of unmarshaling the parameters, dispatching to the right function, figuring out which view to use, I didn't have to worry about any of that, right? So now that much you could get out of things like PHP. The good stuff is yet to come. OK, so let's go through. And how are we doing on time, by the way? Anybody? You have like? OK, good. It hasn't been an hour. OK, so now let's do a, uh, an example that by the standards of Rails is still very simple because it's only going to deal with a single model. We're going to define a model of students, and we're going to do various things to it. Um, so the, the general way that you go about uh, doing a chunk of application like this is you design the model. In other words, what's a student? What attributes does a student have? You instantiate the model, which means that we have to have a database table for it, and we have to have some Ruby code that manipulates that database table. Um, and we're going to define some basic controller actions. So uh, initially, we're going to do what's called the CRUD actions, which are create, read, update, and destroy. Uh, I'll talk about those in just a second. But this is kind of, you know, this is going to be our, our template. Um, SQL 101. I'm going, anybody need a quick, I'll, I'll just assume that some people might not mind a one slide review. Um, SQL is based on a very beautiful model of data organization, which I don't have time to talk about. This margin is too small to contain my lecture on it. Um, but it, you know, it won the Turing Award, so that should tell you that it's the right way to think about data organization. For our purposes, if you, and if you already know all that, that's great. Uh, just tune out for a few minutes. If you don't, as a shortcut, just think of a table as an unordered collection of objects, uh, all of which have the same set of attributes. Uh, so for example, we can postulate that a student object has a last name, a UCB ID number, and a date on which their degree is expected. And we can think of a select statement as picking some subset of those records out based on some criteria. For example, I can say, give me the last names and ID numbers from those entries in the student's table where the degree expected is less than that date. Um, more generally, I can select any subset of attributes from any bunch of tables. And as you'll see, one of the big wins that you get from Rails is how it lets you handle multi-table joins. Uh, and you can specify essentially arbitrary constraints over them. Joins are by far the most interesting part of all this. We'll do them later. For now, we're going to do one table, one model. OK, so that's SQL 101. Um, the four basic operations that you think about doing on uh, a collection of model objects, which in this case, as we'll see, maps to an underlying table, is you can create new instances. You can read instances uh, that exist in the table. You can update the attributes of existing ones, or you can destroy forever existing ones. So here's an example of how you would do each of these in SQL. Uh, for create, I would insert into the student's table a new record where these are the attributes that I'm going to specify for the records. And those are two example val sets of values I'd put in. Uh, for read, select star, which means give me all the attributes for those records that match this criterion. Degree expected is less than that date. Uh, for update, I could say update the student's table. And what form is the update going to take? Well, I'm going to set the degree expected to this new date only for those records where this condition is true. So this would ideally result in updating one student's degree expected. And if Peter is here, he'd be happy to see this because he probably thought he was graduating later. Uh, and to destroy, again, I just say delete from students and I specify some set of criteria. All the records matching that criteria are destroyed. Right? Simple enough. How does this map into, damn it, how does this map into Rails? <clears throat> um, Rails gives you a layer over manipulating a database called Active Record. Uh, it's actually you could do a, a whole day just on what Active Record does, uh, and in fact, Will is going to do about an hour just on that later. Um, but basically, it uses SQL tables usually as its underlying storage. Um, it generates the right set of SQL queries to do the various CRUD manipulations uh, on collections of objects. And as you'll see later, in the case where you have multiple tables that have uh, some hierarchical relationship to each other, it provides an object relationship graph that you can manipulate as a programmer without having to worry about how you would actually do those joins in SQL, which can get quite hairy. Um, so for now, we're going to do a simple, simple, simple single table model. Uh, let's start by defining the model attributes. Not surprisingly, I have done this in advance. Uh, and I'm running Coco MySQL, uh, one of the many open source sets of tools that uh, is a graphical interface to MySQL. Uh, so I defined a really simple model called students, where each student has an ID, which is a long integer, uh, a last name, which is a string, um, a UCB ID number, which is an integer, and a degree expected, which is a date. Don't confuse ID with UCB ID. ID is basically an integer, which is the primary key. And in practice, we'll never actually use this as a real attribute of our data model. But convention over configuration for Rails says, unless you specify otherwise, 
uh, tables will have a field called ID whose type is integer, which is a primary key auto increment. And that's how we're actually going to keep track of records. There's a lot of great reasons to do that as opposed to, say, having one of the actual attributes be the primary key, but we don't have time to talk about them. Many people here know about databases, so ask them if you care about that. That's the definition of the data model. Uh, we also have to then create, um, presumably, we have to create a model file that describes what we do with students. And we have to create a controller with some methods on it. So, <clears throat> uh, and by the way, we'll, we'll talk about this later. There's actually two, at least two different ways that I could have created that database table. One way, which is the bad old way that you probably are used to doing, is uh, through either a graphical tool like Coco MySQL, or if you're really steadily using the SQL command line interpreter, God help you, um, you actually issue the right set of SQL commands or GUI clicks to create the table and add various columns and stuff like that. Um, the preferred way to do it, for reasons we'll come to later, uh, is actually using something called migrations, which to a first order, think of migrations as RCS or CVS, but for your data schema. Um, Rails basically provides a way of doing operations to create and alter tables in the database. And by, uh, by expressing those as a series of what are called migrations, you can actually make sure that your data schema stays in sync with your application code, which turns out to be a neat thing. Um, again, just file that away in the back of your brain for now. Um, but the reason that I pointed out is that you probably noticed, if you were astute, that in addition to my students table, I also have a table called schema info, which just has one field. It's the version number. This is actually automatically generated by Rails. And whenever I use migrations to update my schema, this number is bumped. So if I have an application deployment that spans multiple servers or multiple installations, um, it's easy to make sure automatically that all of my databases are running at the same schema version corresponding to whatever version of the app I've most recently deployed. <clears throat> OK. Um, but. OK, so what are we going to do? How are we going to manipulate the model from, uh, from our students table? Well, we have, going back to Emacs here, let's go into our models directory. Um, not a whole lot here. My model is only two lines long. Uh, what it says is, I'm declaring a model called student. Again, capital letter, then lowercase. Uh, it is a subclass of, or it inherits from, this class called active record base, which you're going to learn a whole lot about. And that's it. At this time, that's all I'm saying about my model. Um, in a minute, we'll show what other cool stuff you can put into your model. Uh, what about the controller? So the expectation is that there will be a students controller.rb. Um, and I've created a controller that has a single line, scaffold student. This is really cool. Uh, scaffold is a way of generating uh, enough function call or enough methods in the controller and enough views to support the basic operations of create, read, update, and delete. Let's see what that means. Uh, let's go back to the browser. Uh, by the way, I should have showed you in the database. I did indeed put one record in here just to get things rolling. And it's a record for myself. As you can see, I'm graduating a few months ago. OK, so what happened here? Um, looking at the URL, that means it's going to find uh, a studentscontroller.rb file, which I showed you. And it's going to try to invoke a method in there called list. But yet, if we look back at the student controller, we don't see any methods at all. So what's going on here is that scaffold actually provides support for a handful of basic methods, one of which is list, which means show me everything in the database. Another of which is show, which means uh, show me the attributes of an individual record. Uh, another of which is edit, which allows me to edit the attributes of an individual record. Uh, in this case, I'm only showing. Oh, I, can't have, I left an attribute out of here, but don't worry about that. Boink. There, I just changed my degree expected date to July 15th. And in fact, if I go back to the list view, you can see that it's been changed there as well. Um, and if I destroy, I get an automatic little alert box here. I will go ahead and confirm. Uh, now there's no students in the database, so I'll just add one back in. All right, that's pretty good for writing zero lines of code. Um, <clears throat> so what's actually going on here? Um, to a first order, and again, I'm simplifying a little bit for the sake of, of uh, intellectual content. But what's happening is that Scaffold is using metaprogramming to generate a set of controller methods on the fly that will respond to new, create, list, update, and delete. Um, what about the views? Where are the views coming from? Because if we look at the, uh, whoops, 
Oh, well, we don't even have a student's view directory, but that's all right. Um, I'll create one in a minute. So there's no subdirectory containing views that correspond to those actions, but Scaffold is basically doing that as well. In other words, there's HTML templates that are the default, highly undecorated templates for doing these basic operations. They're being pulled in automatically by the scaffolding. In fact, if I want to selectively override them, I could do that, right? I could, for example, decide that in the, uh, well, actually, let me show you the other way to do it. Um, the idea behind scaffolding is that it gives you a quick and dirty way to get chunks of your app up and functionally running. And then you can selectively start overriding the scaffolding pieces as you need them. Uh, in fact, the other way to do scaffolding, which is far more interesting, hopefully this will work without barfing, but we'll see in a minute. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Sorry, it's an old machine. Cool. So uh, this is and this script generate. Remember I mentioned that there's this directory that's part of your application called scripts, and it contains a bunch of useful utility scripts. Well, here's one of them. Uh, the generate script allows you to automatically generate various automatic chunks of templates, scaffolding, things like that, which you can then replace at your leisure. In this case, what we said is generate scaffolding for a model called student. So again, convention over configuration means I'm going to create scaffolding in a subdirectory of views called students. Uh, here's all the templates for the specific actions. Let's go take a look at what these things look like. I'm going to reload this file. OK, so this is all automatically generated code. right? It's automatically generated from some pretty simple templates. And we'll walk through different parts of it uh, during different times today. But you can see that, as a very simple example, the show method has now been made explicit. right? When I say show an individual student record, it will look for something in the params hash called ID. So that implies uh, that if I now look at the views, and I look, for example, at the list view, uh, the list view is going to contain a bunch of hyperlinks. Oops, sorry about the highlighting there. Uh, one of whose components is the ID of each record being shown. And if I take a look at the, if I hover over this, let's see if you can actually see it. There you go. Uh, so if you can look at the very bottom, you can see the, the hover. If I were to click on that link, that's where I would go. I would call the show action. And again, by convention, if there's one and only one numeric argument, uh, it's going to be taken as the ID indeed. Um, so basically, what's happened here is that this is the code that had been uh, automatically generated on the fly before. Now the code's actually been instantiated so that I could selectively go in and start modifying the controller methods. But this is useful because you can inspect it to see sort of how things work. So for example, what happens when I clicked the New button to create a new student? Uh, all it did was create a student object uh, with a constructor and didn't fill in any fields of it. If I look at the view that it would then fall through, Um, oh, I'm going to have to explain partials in a minute. Uh, for the moment, um, just pretend that this bottom file is interpolated where it says render partial, but we'll talk about that separately. Uh, so this is the view that corresponds to the new action. Uh, this is, there's a different syntax for starting a form, but basically it's going to display a form which when submitted will call the create action in the controller. Uh, this is what the form is going to look like. It's going to have various fields for me to fill in uh, things about the student. Then there's a submit tag, and then there's those two links. Uh, so for example, you can see link to back uh, means create an HTML link whose URL is such that when the person clicks on it, they'll be redirected to this controller action. So this is another example of the, you know, the, the reason to use convention over configuration is because of the amount of other stuff that's provided for you, allowing you to use shorthand kind of like that. Um, so you know, what happened in this case? Uh, when we use the first form of scaffold, which is to just put a scaffold macro into the controller, um, metaprogramming was used to create controller methods on the fly, which in turn generate the generic views. Um, then we actually caused the scaffolding to be instantiated as real code and real views. So it created a bunch of extra files and directories for us with templated stuff, which now we could go in and, and change at our leisure. For example, if I wanted to modify uh, this new view, um, I'll make a really trivial change, but uh, you know, it gets the point across. I'll save that. Uh, and now if I go back to the list and I create a new student, well, the color equals red didn't work, but that's because I don't know HTML syntax anymore. I rely on it being auto-generated. Um, yeah, well, whatever. Uh, but in fact, 
Uh, in fact, my tag actually did take, right? Um, so I can selectively start mucking around with these things. In fact, I can disable the ones I don't want. For example, if for whatever reason I don't want it to be possible to destroy a student, um, I could go back into the, con and no comments about that, please. Um, I could, you know, this is rather draconian, but I can certainly do it. Uh, and I can also go and delete the corresponding view. Oh, there's no view for destroy. Ah, but there's a good reason for that. Uh, so now if I actually try to destroy a student, the wrong thing should happen. No action responded to destroy. Um, that's a very nice way of, of wrapping up an exception. But basically, it just means the controller was found, but you appeared to specify this action, and there is no controller method that has that name. John? Why, by convention, does it just automatically get a, an action there so that deleting it would revert to the default? Say again, why don't you? What was the question? It seems like, it seems like in the past, when you didn't have things there, defaults were automatically provided for you. Why, in this case, is it not providing a default for that destroy action? It did provide one, but I deleted it. Are you saying, how would we like, OK, you say we would like it to be the case that if you call an action to which nothing responds, that there is a default thing that you'll get redirected back to instead of that. Is that the question? Well, if you create, I'll bet if you create a view, destroy it, it might show it. The view would be shown. It would automatically render the view, but, it, um, but you need the action for destroy. Destroy actually doesn't have a view, because it just does a redirect back to the um, Yeah, we haven't talked list. about redirect to yet, but yeah. th that's coming up in. That was probably a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> that shouldn't have happened. And don't, you know, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. But I'm. Right. Does that answer the question? I think so, yeah. So, OK. So may maybe here's what I think you said. If, if I added back. Uh, into my control. So I could, in theory, add this back here. OK, this, if Will tell me if I'm doing the wrong thing here. But I think I'm, doing, I'm, I think I'm doing the right thing. Let's reload the page. Override all the, yeah, this should work. Yeah. OK, so that worked. The question is, why did it work, right? So now I've actually got both a scaffold line, but I also have a bunch of explicit methods. The simple answer is that scaffold We'll define them all by default, but by defining them later in the file, I'm selectively overriding some of them. Um, because I deleted the explicit destroy method, I'm now no longer overriding the default destroy method. But once I get rid of this line, whoops, the default method uh, instantiations go away. And now it's entirely on me. Does that make sense? Good. Put that in your feedback. Um, uh, similarly, the scaffold rendering method, if you have existing RHTML templates that you've already created, it will respect those and will not stomp on them. When it generates all those files, it will actually ask you if you want to stomp on them or not. Um, if you use the scaffold uh, inline command, uh, like I just uh, went through again, um, again, with that method, by default, if necessary, it will create RHTML templates for you on the fly. But if you have some templates defined, it will respect the ones you have. So it's all geared toward sort of allowing you to very painlessly, incrementally develop your application without having to tear down stuff that you wrote before. Right? You can kind of incrementally keep adding on. Um, other things to notice about scaffolding. Um, you saw you know, when I ran the scaffold command in my terminal window, all these files that got created, I've pulled out some of the more interesting ones over here. Um, you'll notice that there's a couple of things that are created in a testing directory. So it's basically created a skeleton for me to do unit testing on students. And it's also created a place where I can put data to pre-populate the test database for those test cases. Uh, it's also provided a, um, a skeleton for me to write a test for the controller. Uh, so as we'll see, there's actually uh, multiple kinds of tests you can write. But one important distinction is, am I testing methods of the model? In other words, whether the model is correctly being manipulated in the database versus am I testing the way that the model is rendered or the way that the user interactions with the model are supposed to be dispatched? Um, <laughs> I don't know why that didn't get hidden. But um, <clears throat> as you can see, it created a bunch of default views that previously had been automatically generated on the fly. Um, it also created something called uh, layout. So the, uh, so far, we've only been looking at these RHTML templates. But in fact, in practice, the templates get wrapped up in a couple of other layers that try to capture commonality. Uh, in particular, there's a student's RHTML template, which captures, if we take a look at it, um, 
So this is actually being wrapped around all of the individual view templates for students. And all it's trying to do is capture commonality that might conceivably apply to any of the student objects. If I delete this template, it simply won't be used. It's not an error for it not to exist. Uh, in this case, you can see that one of the things that it does is it takes the action name of the controller as the page title. Um, and indeed, if we go back to the web browser, you can see that students colon list is the title of this page. And if I click this, I get students colon new. Um, it also pulls in a CSS style sheet. This says, look for a style sheet called scaffold.css. Um, and that's the style sheet that's providing the visual appearance of this page, which is admittedly pedestrian. Uh, again, I could delete either of those if I wanted. <clears throat> um, and as we'll also see, there is an additional uh, application layer RHTML template that wraps every page view in the application. Again, those are conventions. On a per method basis, you can always say, don't use any templates for this, or use this alternate template for the layout instead of the default one, or whatever. Um, OK, we're almost to the end of the section, I think. Um, more examples of convention over configuration that you've seen, right? So we defined a student model. The table is called students, which is the plural of student. By the way, that means that, yes, a person lives in a table called people. A goose lives in a table called geese. There's a separate class called inflectors that tells you how to singularize and pluralize various words so that Rails can get that right. Um, which means that if you want to customize it for some weird language where plurals don't end in S, like every language except English, like you could fish. probably do that. Um, so there's a controller. The class is called students controller. Note the capitalization. Uh, there is a file called students underscore controller dot RB. That's where the default controller is. There is a subdirectory containing all the views. And metaprogramming makes all the scaffolding happen so that you don't actually have to write a single line of code to manipulate students in your database. Again, no comments, please, about manipulating students. Um, there's a table called students, which has a primary key called ID. By default, that's what Rails expects. And as we'll show when we talk about migrations, if you use Rails as mechanisms for creating your tables, um, you'll by default get a, uh, a table whose primary key is auto increment integer ID. The object attribute names match the names of the table columns. Uh, and I can show you uh, let's we can get it out of here. No, we can't get it. Yes, that's where it is. OK, let me grab that code. Let's try one other thing, just so that I can show off. So I'm going to generate a different type of script uh, since I've been prattling about database migrations, and while they're great, I will show you for the sake of example how you might create one. Um, I'm going to invoke the generate script again, which has a repertoire of interesting behaviors. Although instead of creating a scaffold, I'm saying create a migration for me and call it create students. Let's take a look at what got automatically created. So now I'm going to go look in the database subdirectory. Uh, now a new subdirectory has been created called migrate, uh, and there's only one file in it right now. Uh, and it contains two methods that I'm presumably supposed to fill in, up and down. What the up and down methods correspond to is that as I evolve my database schema, as my app gets more sophisticated, I can essentially specify that certain changes can be applied non-destructively by putting code in the up method that says, here's how to migrate the schema from version n to version n plus 1. Uh, in some cases, those changes may be reversible or partially reversible. I can put that stuff into the down function. Um, and then I can actually migrate my database schema forwards or backwards in time if, for example, I deploy a new version of the app, it's a disaster, and I need to undeploy it. But to roll the app back, I also need to roll the schema back. So this is what gives you the ability to do that. I cut and pasted some code, which I'm now going to put in. There it is. Um, here's how my database is going to get to version 001. <clears throat> uh, there, I'm going to use this create table directive. There is the name of the table. I'm going to say force true just because the table exists right now. And by default, it wouldn't destroy it otherwise. Um, this is an example of a Ruby construct that you'll learn about later called a block. But basically, what's happening is that this create table, the, the result of the table creation is this object, which I'm then going to bind to T uh, in the body of this block. Inside that table, I'm going to create three columns. And you can see that for each column, I have a type, and I also have some SQL options. Uh, in particular, note for this last one that I'm saying degree expected. Uh, it's OK for that column to be null, and in fact, if a record is created and nothing is specified as the value for that column, then use null as the default. What happens if I actually do that? And let me uh, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain here, but I have to remove, whoops, that's not what I meant. I have to remove this table in order for this to work correctly. OK. Rake migrate. It sounds like a postmodern play. 
Uh, rake is a task that is a, a set of utilities that comes with rails that are bundled together that you can think of as a more sophisticated moral equivalent of make. Uh, it allows you to define various tasks for maintaining your source code and your application. Um, one of the tasks that it understands is, yeah, I know, migrate has been deprecated. I should have called it something else. One of the tasks that it understands is apply migrations to my database. So what happened here? Um, first of all, it had to figure out what migration to apply. Anybody have any idea how that's figured out? Here's a hint. It begins with C. And it also ends, it's convention over configuration again, right? So what, let's see, in my database, there was no table for schema versioning, so I assume no migrations have been applied yet. I look in the directory called db slash migrate, and I take a look at what's there. Uh, in this case, there's only the one file that I created, plus this extra code that's for the class, so don't look at it. Um, but if I now refresh my database view, and I think, there we go, uh, a new table has been created called schema info. It only has a single attribute and only a single record, um, which means I am now at schema version one. In the future, if I were to now run rake migrate again, uh, except that I have to, for this, there, let's do that. <laughs> I'll think for a while, and I will do nothing, right? Except it takes a long time to do nothing because I have an old machine. Um, there we go. So other than the warning method about my, the warning message about my syntax being deprecated, um, it didn't actually do anything here like it did up here. Why? Because the schema is at version one, and because in this uh, migrations directory, um, there's no higher numbered migration than what the current schema is. If there had been a migration beginning with 002-something, that would have been a signal that that migration has to be applied. In fact, migrate by default will apply every single migration until it brings the database uh, table schema info up to date with whatever the latest migration is. Um, so that's kind of the nice way to create a table because in the future, uh, I can evolve that table. I can do alter table commands in the context of a migration. I can move data around. So it's not just changing the schema, right? If I decide that I'm going to generate some new data field uh, in the student record that I can synthesize from existing fields, I can put code into the up function of my migration to actually compute that. So applying the migration is a schema change as well as some data massaging. Um, and again, if it's destructive, uh, you can always, th there's a clause you can put into the down method that says this migration is not reversible, um, which will cause an exception if you then try to reverse it. Okay, recap, and I think we're done with whirlwind part one. Metaprogramming, great thing. Here's an actual use for it in real life. And we, we plan to emphasize this when we teach the course. Uh, one of the things that our undergrads get taught in the scheme class is they get taught higher order functions and how to use them. And then they start programming in Java, and that idea kind of disappears off the face of the earth from their careers. So we're hoping to, to bring this back as an example of metaprogramming really can be your friend. It has uses in real life. In our case, we showed how it can be used to create scaffolding. Uh, it provides the mapping between instance methods and table columns, um, as you'll see when Will talks about uh, active record. Um, the scaffolding facility is a powerful way to get an app off the ground very early without a lot of effort. You can selectively replace the pieces of scaffolding as you go along. Uh, but as it's set up, it captures this very common model of a web front end to a database that stores your models and provides the basic operations of create, read, update, and delete. Um, and again, I keep saying this, but as when you consider multi-model relationships, which Will is going to do after lunch, you'll see how much more powerful this is than actually dealing with the database directly. Um, so the next thing after a short break is uh, we're going to take a closer look at model view controller and Rails. Will is going to talk about Ruby the language so that you can actually uh, put some, some systematic knowledge behind the code examples that I've been doing. But it just gets faster from here. So this would be a good time to ask questions. How are we doing on time? And we started at what, like a quarter after? A quarter 20? after, yeah. Okay, so it's not too, too bad. Okay, any questions about this stuff? And by the way, I know that for some of you who have done some of the tutorials, some of this is probably review. Thank you for your forbearance. Uh, for those of you who have not seen this before, any questions? Okay, uh, yes? Yeah, rm-rf. Um, no, I'm sorry. I'm being glib. Uh, I don't know that there's a, an equivalent. There's no ungenerate that I know about. Um, you can go through and selectively delete stuff. Um, and what's interesting is, you know, so, so in the, for example, um, if I leave my scaffolding commands in, I can selectively delete certain views and allow the scaffolding command to provide defaults for them. So I don't know if that's what you meant. but And you're using version control anyway, right? So you can delete stuff and then undelete them later. So the uh, model migration that you did, uh, that was in your application development directory as opposed to out in some 
appointment director that was simply sitting on an ISP server. So how would you, you'd have to actually have to do that command. To make it really take effect, if you were deployed, you'd have to do that. On right, well, that's an excellent question. So everything I've been doing, I have an entirely self-contained environment on my laptop. So I have a web server running, I have uh, a Rails framework running. Um, I'm using Locomotive, which is a nice standalone thing. Um, and I also have a MySQL instance running here for development purposes. In real life, my real app is out on an ISP somewhere, which runs its own MySQL server. And what Rich is saying is, wouldn't you have to then SSH over to your ISP and run that migrate command to apply the changes to your production database? Yes, you would. Uh, just as if I'm making changes to my code and I check them in, I have to SSH over to my ISP check out the new code changes, and then flip a pointer to make sure the new version is the one that users are pointing to. The good news is that there is a huge number of tools built right into Rails to help you do that. So in the common case, you don't actually ever SSH to anywhere. Instead, instead you say cap deploy, which you're going to learn about later. But roughly, that means log into all my remote servers where my production environment is, see if there's a new copy of the code. If so, check it out. If, see if there's new migrations to run. See if there are new tests to run. Make sure the regressions don't fail. When all of that is done, flip a symbolic link pointer and restart the web server. So all of that stuff gets captured in these really powerful macros. Um, and if you turn out to make a boo-boo, you can run a macro that essentially rolls all that stuff back. So yes, the answer to your question is you do have to do it, but you don't have to do it manually. Yes? Another question. Um, sometimes on applications that I've written, I need to like run a daily, a daily operation on the database or something, you know, kind of offline. Excellent question. Yes, there are. Uh, so the, the question is, it's all well and good that you do all these cool things to your database in the context of your application, meaning you have defined models, you have all these utility methods on models, which we haven't seen yet, but we soon will. Um, but what if you need to do the equivalent of that on a periodic basis in your deployed environment? There's basically another uh, one of the things in the script directory called runner is basically a script that will, when you run it, it will bootstrap your application environment so that it looks just like the environment when you're running inside, let's say, a controller. So you can essentially write Rails code that does all of the things you want. And in your cron file, you say, every whatever runs script runner with the following argument. Um, and that has the effect of allowing you to write code that believes it's running in the same environment as the app would, and it can do whatever it wants to the database or whatever. Yes? Suppose I've used the scaffolding, I instantiate a bunch of it, and then I overrode a few of the functions. And then a newer, better version of the scaffolding gets released. Is there the equivalent of migration for all of my controller code that <coughs> derived from the scaffolding? So let me let me reinterpret that. Um, a new, new stuff in the scaffolding. so a new version of the scaffolding cult comes out, and what you would like to do is manually generate scaffolding with the new cooler version, and then paste that into your controller over the old version. Uh, you're, you're describing an algorithm. What I want to get is I want to get all the good new stuff from the scaffolding without wrecking all the code I added in by hand. Basically, I want some sort of merge. That's a good question. There, I, there isn't, yeah, there, I don't think there that there's a, a standard. Classic yeah. Was sort of templating code or yeah. A, yeah. Well, in general, when it's pretty minimal. You usually don't want to do that. What you can do, though, is it will update all, all the style sheets, and it will update the uh, JavaScript libraries that are used for some of the scaffolding and AJAX and everything else. The scaffolding is pretty straightforward. Yeah, but you're not gonna, you don't really need to change. Once your scaffold, the scaffold is just a starting point. Usually after the scaffold is there, you then make modifications to the scaffold. Nobody really sticks with the scaffold through their entire application life cycle. <coughs> it's I actually have a deployed production app that has some scaffolding in place. Oh. But the, um, I, I think the, uh, the, the uh, issue no, where no, it's no. most thorny mm -hmm. is because of the fact that the scaffold by default will generate code that goes into your controller. But if you actually look at the controller code that the scaffolding generates, it's, it's like three line functions. So it's unlikely that if, new, better scaffolding were released, that the improvement would be in the way that it generates controller code. The improvement would probably be, like Will said, in things like style sheets, something about the visual representation and the user interaction. And that stuff, you could just non-destructively deploy those files alongside the ones you wrote and then figure out which one you want. Um, in fact, you can keep both sets of files deployed. And in the controller methods, you can selectively say, for certain controller methods, render it with this fancy new template. Um, and for other controller methods, you don't make that declaration. And the default is to use your current ones. So there's generally ways to do it, but there's not a one-line answer. Yeah? What about you know, transactions and conflicting updates to the database by different users hitting your application simultaneously? Uh, how much are you going to talk about We're going to get back. We're going to get into transactions. The, the answer later. is yes. You, you can wrap arbitrary, almost arbitrary things in transactions. Yeah. And the right things will happen. With, and you can mm -hmm. specify rollback functions and stuff like that. 
Right? You guys are asking all the hard questions early. Save some for later. OK, anything else? Otherwise, is it break time? Should we take like a, a three minute stretch break? Okay, yeah, five. Or whatever? Three to five minutes, but, but not a lot longer than that so we don't get too far behind. Next is Ruby. Okay.